Hello everyone and welcome back to Gran Turismo 7 for yet another video today. We have a brand new manufacturer as of update 1.45 which we'll be taking a look at today and that is Skoda making an appearance. The Czech car manufacturer in Gran Turismo for the very first time in the form of a Vision Gran Turismo car uh, which is uh, simply named Skoda VGT. So. We'll be checking out this car as well as uh, a couple of other interesting cars that were added uh, in this update. But first, uh, let's take a little read about it. Founded in 1895, Skoda is an established automaker with almost 130 years of history behind it. Active in motorsport since its early days, the company has competed in countless races and rallies. Skoda's first Vision Gran Turismo was a single-seater EV inspired by its racing history. Design-wise, it pays homage to the 1100 OHC, which competed at the Le Mans 24 hours in 1957. An all-wheel drive car, its four motors, one for each wheel, boasts a combined output of 800 kilowatts or 1,072 brake horsepower. The two liveries that adorn its carbon monocoque chassis each have a story to tell. While one uses the 1970s rally bred 130RS as its motif, the other takes inspiration from the Vision 7S, a concept car unveiled in 2022. And uh, yeah, that is uh, the little story about the uh, Skoda VGT. almost forgot what uh, brand we were talking about there, but anyway. Um, so yeah, you can uh, see the two liveries, not so much from the back. But uh, yeah, I'm going to go with this uh, strappy design. Uh, it just looks a little bit more interesting. So that's the one we are going to go for. And uh, yeah, million credits, just like uh, every other uh, standard VGT. And uh, gotta say, looks pretty cool front on. We'll see how it goes on track. We've got a Vision uh, GT Trophy uh, race to do at uh, Grand Valley Highway. So let's take this thing for a spin as the full layout of the circuit, uh, which uh, is uh, the uh, better of the two versions in my opinion. But uh, yeah, let's see how this thing goes immediately. You can feel that uh, 1,072 horsepower that uh, this car has as uh, it was a rocket ship off the line and uh, yeah we are going to be making pretty quick progress uh, through the field uh, but it does struggle a little bit in the corners which is quite typical of uh, a VGT um, we're going to cut to the chase on this first attempt had a bit of an incident on the final lap while leading and uh, yeah clip that inside wall but uh, what's more interesting is what happened next as hard as I try to accelerate uh, the car would not move forwards and uh, yeah we just had this very unusual uh, wheel spin as I'm flicking through the camera angles um, but yeah even after I lift off the wheels continue to spin uh, very very rapidly and the dust is getting kicked up I don't really know what the story is here the car's actually was uh, rolling backwards there but uh, anyway yeah I don't know what uh, what was going on but uh, anyway, that dropped us all the way uh, to uh, well near the back of the field. We're not quite last yet. Uh, we are just at the back of the top 10 now as we eventually uh, get it going again. We do a bit of a 360 though because I'm trying to see uh, if there was anything off the edge of the track there that was uh, catching us out. Even on the road there, the wheels were spinning like crazy. So yeah, I don't know what it is about this car, but uh, there's something weird with uh, the wheel spin, the traction. Um, I don't know if it's something to do with having a separate electric motor for each wheel. So I don't know if they're all like, you know, just free spinning, not connected to each other in any way. Um, I'm not sure. But whatever the case is, uh, that was a very uh, weird moment. And I've not experienced that uh, in any other car. So anyway, even with all that, we still managed to bring on P10 in this race, just given the field spread in these uh, Vision GT races. But uh, we will need to have another go at this. 
Uh, this is also one of the cars where you get uh, a special suit while you're driving it rather than your own uh, custom suit. But anyway, um, we'll see if we can have better luck on the second attempt uh, at this race as we uh, have successful, or quite successfully made that move which has been re-overtaken but with the horsepower we'll be absolutely fine to get that position back and I've just done exactly the same thing, clipped the inside, sent us into a spin and uh, the same thing happens again, we get this weird uh, instance of wheel spin and we just, uh, yeah, are trying to accelerate out of it and uh, well yeah Someone will need to explain to me what's going on here because I do not understand it at all. But uh, yeah, even if you lift off, the wheels just do not stop spinning at all. Uh, we're even in reverse gear there. Um, and uh, yeah, they're still just going crazy. So <laughs> I don't know what's going on with this car. It is uh, is very strange. But uh, yeah, if you spin in that particular spot, it seems to happen uh, basically every time. But anyway... We are going to go again, and a uh, handful of attempts later, we'll see if we can get a clean run through the race without uh, making any mistakes at that particular corner where it seems to be susceptible uh, to having that issue. But uh, anyway, good move at uh, turn one, and uh, we'll just about hold on to uh, P15 this time as we navigate the first corner successfully and move ourselves up a position and uh, yeah trying to keep it steady through here because it's got so much power and uh, it's not that good in the other areas in terms of its uh, handling wise um, it is a little bit tricky to drive which uh, as I said earlier is quite characteristic of a lot of EGTs they have all the straight line speed in the world but the brakes and turning are, uh, are not so good so it does make things a little bit interesting to, uh, to drive but uh, we're making steady progress so far and uh, we're up into P14 so two spots gained so far in this race but we'll need a lot more than that uh, if we want to uh, challenge for the win so as we continue to uh, close in to the cars in front not gaining too much in the corners but as soon as we get onto this bridge uh, we will go flying on past one maybe even both of these cars look at that speed build and uh, yeah that is an easy move and uh, we get up another two spots into P12. We uh, continue on then and uh, we'll round up a couple more cars on the exit of the tunnel that'll get us up into the top 10. Now the straight line speed builds up towards uh, turn one as we start a new lap and uh, not able to quite close the gap but uh, we're basically there and uh, we should be able to get this move done on the exit once we get the power down and uh, yeah the power uh, laid down very very nicely uh, not a lot of wheel spin uh, that you can get out of this car as we uh, try and swing it through we can't quite get through without contact but uh, we'll make the move regardless and uh, we're all the way up now into P7 got another little cluster of cars as we'll try and uh, make our way through can't quite find a spot there maybe down the inside we're all swapping and changing here and uh, eventually with a little bit of contact uh, we'll not quite actually get through, we'll make one move and uh, up into P6, but uh, there's a lot of proving difficult to pass. We'll go down the inside as uh, we uh, head towards the rock shelter power down and uh, that should be position made. Uh, up one more spot into P5 and uh, we should be able to get the move done for P4 as well, uh, which we do. And uh, yeah, the podium will have a bit of a gap, but uh, we will soon chase them down. We're about to see a perfect example of the straight line speed this car can carry straight down the inside into the tunnel. No competition there. As we uh, continue on, the Subaru Visiv uh, running very high up the field in this one. But uh, we'll get down the inside into uh, the next left-hander through the rock shelter. But uh, the Subaru back down the inside, barging their way back through. So we can't quite get the move done yet as we'll try to line up a good exit and uh, get the power down nicely we'll tuck underneath and move, move up into P2 we move on then to the final lap we've got the race leader right in front of us in uh, yet another Skoda we'll make the move around the outside though and uh, get through the tunnel cleanly and uh, that's going to be a race victory for us here at Grand Valley Highway in the Skoda VGT um, in summary a bit of understeer 
as is the main characteristic with a lot of EGCs, but very, very rapid on the straights, plenty of horsepower, and uh, overall still pretty fun to drive. It would just be nice to have a little bit more in the turning capabilities. The next car we are going to take a look at though is this thing, the Chevrolet Chevelle. The 1970 Chevrolet Chevelle SS was Chevrolet's mid-size muscle car. The optional LS6 engine provided plenty of performance, even for a car as big as this one. The 7.4 litre 454 engine was given increased compression, high lift cams and special cylinder heads. Its published power rating of 449.7 brake horsepower was likely the highest catalogued output for any American car. It was an incredible street car that could easily surpass 493.1 brake horsepower with very little tuning. And I do realize I was a little bit behind through all of that, but uh, that's just how it goes. Anyway, that's a very oddly specific number um, to say you can surpass 493.1 horsepower. Is, I, wonder, I don't know if that's an exact translation in kilowatts or some other unit of power, but uh, to say it can surpass a decimal point of horsepower is uh, quite strange. But anyway, the first thing I did when I bought the Chevelle was tune it up for the Trans Am series. So we've de detuned it a little bit for uh, for this, so we'll see how it goes. Um, it's the American FR Challenge 550, and uh, yeah, we are actually running above that. But because uh, we have a lot of sort of the parts that won't have a huge impact on the performance, uh, for example, you know, suspension is uh, you know not going to have a huge impact on our overall lap speed but it increases the performance points by a lot that's why sometimes in Trans Am we don't even run the suspension we can just use stock with uh, certain cars on certain tracks but uh, anyway let's see what we can uh, do in this race as we have a little bit of a wheel it's the reverse direction of Trial Mountain so uh, this is going to mess with my head a little bit as we start to barge our way uh, through the field and uh, already you can see we're going pretty quickly. A little bit of a snap there and uh, the car uh, does want to pendulum from side to side a bit. So uh, we need to watch out for that. Um, the super boat can be a little guilty of that too. But uh, anyway, we're up into P6 already. So making rapid progress uh, in this race. What can I do in terms of top end speed? Looks like we've got it uh, stretched. Uh, long enough to run here at Trial Mountain. Uh, but that is very often a thing when you upgrade an old car. You can uh, just slam into the uh, rev limiter in top gear uh, with uh, plenty of uh, straight left to go uh, because, uh, of course, old cars have quite short to short gear ratios in comparison to uh, you know modern cars that might have a little bit more horsepower. But uh, anyway, we are racing our way uh, through the field still making the move uh, down the inside and uh, we make our way up into fourth position so great progress on the first lap and uh, I imagine we might be able to uh, crack the top three very shortly as uh, we get a nice run on the exit we'll make the move down the inside and uh, get ahead of the uh, Firebird there very nice car I uh, do love the old Firebirds but uh, we're through and uh, we're going to sneak our way through a big snap of all sorts of directions there. But uh, we're up into second position now with just the race leader a bit further up the road. And it takes no time at all for us to catch up to the race leader in the Shelby GT350. A car we might see returning in the next season of Trans Am. We move ourselves up into the race lead with uh, still more than, well still almost two laps to go in this race. So uh, this car is a pretty quick, just a little bit tail happy. We move on then eventually to the end of the race with uh, no further issues. We'll cross the line to take P1 here at Trail Mountain. And uh, yeah, like I said, uh, no big deal, relatively easy affair here in the, the new Chevrolet Chevelle. Very nice car. And uh, yeah, we'll look amazing in the Trans Am series. Cheetah's already driven it in the final round of season three. And uh, hopefully we'll see it uh, pop up every once in a while in future as well. But the final car for the episode is probably the weirdest. Uh, it is the Afila Prototype 2024. What is it? I don't really know. 
Afila is Sony and Honda's ever-evolving vision of the future of mobility. A prototype of the car was unveiled in early 2024 at CES, the world's biggest tech trade show. Dubbed the Afila Prototype 2024, it employs the latest sensing technology and AI to expand the possibilities of movement. This includes features that optimise a natural driving experience and a personal mobility agent that communicates intelligently with the driver and their passengers. The media bar on the front works as an external communication device, while the large dashboard display enlivens the cabin with all kinds of entertainment. The future of mobility, a feeler marks a revolution in the act of movement itself. I don't know about you, but I feel like that story was very vague. It said a lot of things without actually explaining much. It talked about having, you know, sensing, te sensing technology. Goodness me, I've been having trouble saying that today. But, uh, yeah, it, it mentioned that sort of stuff, which kind of made me think it would be like a, a self-driving car, but it also mentioned having a natural driving experience. But it also mentioned having all kinds of entertainment on the dashboard, which, if it's a car you're driving yourself, you don't really need because you should be focusing on the road. I don't know, I'm very confused about what this car is. But either way, we're going to drive it now, so let's see how it goes. Um, also, apologies that uh, we've been missing some of the menu uh, music in uh, this. The menus have been uh, very, very quiet. I don't know why, to be honest. But uh, anyway, um, the first attempt at that race was uh, kind of average. The only reason this is worth showing is that uh, this race just happened to be one of the uh, weekly challenges, which means we get a reward for uh, getting in the top three. But uh, we're going to move straight on to our second crack at this one as we get underway and uh, we'll see what we can do with uh, you know a bit of practice uh, racing it all says it's a circuit that needs practice it's uh, I'd argue one of the most difficult circuits in the game and one I've just never clicked with at all to be completely honest so yeah we'll have to uh, really focus and uh, try not to make any mistakes in this race if we want to come away with the top spot so yeah as we uh, race on we've already uh, made our way up the field a little bit and up into uh, position number nine so uh, gaining uh, three spots already off the start but uh, yeah there's a lot of progress that's still to be made in this race we've got a bit of time to get it done three laps and this is a fairly long circuit so uh, there's no huge rush but uh, we do want to make sure we are uh, not wasting any time. So as we catch up to the next couple of cars, we will need to find a sneaky way through here. We'll switch back on the left-hand side and uh, we'll be able to get through there and move ourselves up. And another couple of positions into P7. Already got the next car in sight as uh, we're going to try and take the left-hand side of the road as the inside for the next corner. And uh, that works out very well for us and we're just... Uh, had enough space to work with there as we head into the braking zone and uh, out to the other side of the next left-hander and uh, we'll see if we can make another overtake here if we can go late enough on the brakes into this corner it's only a slight dab of the brakes into this uh, long sweeping right-hander that uh, we get through and move ourselves up another position and uh, into the top five now so making pretty rapid progress on this first lap but as always the cars towards the front of the field are a lot faster and it'll take us a little bit longer to uh, to make our way through those cars so this is the kind of progress we need we do need uh, to be making in this race as uh, we sit in the slipstream see if we can maybe make a move towards the next corner we're going to go uh, to the outside switch to the inside uh, a late decision there to do that as uh, it looked like we weren't going to be left too much space on the outside We'll make the move stick and uh, get ourselves up into P4 at the end of the first lap. It doesn't take us too long to catch up to the next couple of cars. We'll make the move around the outside and up into the podium places now. As uh, we've got a little Mazda in front of us. Can we make the move maybe down the inside here? 
up into second position. Looks like we'll be able to do it. Just the race leader now in front. And uh, once again, it doesn't take us too long to catch up to the race leader. Still uh, lap two of the race. Still got more than uh, a lap to go, but uh, we make that move. We've got the racing soft tires on the car just to be able to get this race done. And uh, yeah, they proved to be very effective as uh, we've now got all the pace in the world. Did the final lap uh, racing on board and uh, yeah, we were able to drive away. So yeah, pretty easy one once we uh, put the racing tires on. Of course, tires make a huge difference. So very much took the, the easy way out there, but the race is done. And uh, yeah, that is Vila. It's a very hard car to describe how it handles because it doesn't really have any defining characteristics it's just drives like a car which is not a bad thing it's a very you know smooth consistent easy car to drive but uh yeah nothing really makes it uh, stand out in any particular way but uh it's a nice car regardless but anyway we've got a menu book to go through and uh it is the ferrari 12 cylinder engine collection completed and a uh, six star roulette ticket uh, for our troubles. So let's see what we can learn about these cars or these engines perhaps. Debuted in 1947, the 125S was Ferrari's first race car and the basis for the 125F1, its first F1 machine. The source of all Ferraris to come these two cars ran on 1.5 litre V12 engines. The V12 presented many hurdles, what with its large number of parts, complexity and cost. At the same time, it had many virtues such as its power, feel and sound. From the start, Ferrari has been powering its cars with such V12s. The 125S and F1 had V12s designed by famed Ferrari engineer Gioacchino Colombo. The Colombo engine powered several well-known Ferraris over the years, including the 250 GTO. One other famous car that ran on Colombo's masterpiece was this legendary GT of the 1960s the Ferrari 365 GTB4, also known as the Daytona. Another great Ferrari 12-cylinder engine was the Boxer, with its pair of horizontally opposed six-cylinder heads. The name comes from the way the right and left pistons come together like two fists. The 12-cylinder Boxer engine powered the 312B and other Ferrari F1 machines throughout the 1970s. As well as the road-going BB Berlinetta Boxer. And this Ferrari Testarossa. Since the F50 of 1997, even limited edition models have been powered by V12 engines. This LaFerrari from 2013 is one such example. A hybrid car, it was the first road-going Ferrari to combine a V12 engine and an F1-derived energy recovery system. And so, the V12 engine that Enzo Ferrari once selected to win his motorsport races has been passed down as a symbol of his company to this day. And there we have it, all about Ferrari's V12 engines. But uh, yeah, that is uh, just about to, uh, going to do it for this one. We have a few roulette, roulette tickets uh, to spin, two in fact. One for the uh, weekly challenge, the other for the uh, extra menu. So let's uh, go ahead and spin these up and see what we get. In this first one, we got a variety of different uh, options, some different prize monies as well as some cars. But uh, we're going to get the 500k, which is probably the best thing on offer there with uh, where we are in the game at the moment. 
Uh, we'll always use more money at some point, so that's not too bad. This next one is specifically a parts ticket. So what you're going to get is pretty limited and uh, it looks like we're going to get some kind of fancy stick. Uh, what is it? It is a uh, carbon propeller shaft valued at 6,000 credits. Not great, it's for a Dodge Viper. But uh, anyway, that is going to do it for this one. So I will say thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. Drove some pretty uh, interesting cars in this one. A Skoda in the game for the first time. A feeler, a brand new manufacturer as well. Whatever that thing is, I still don't really know. And uh, of course, the uh, second car we drove, uh, the Chevelle, an exciting car for Trans Am. But like I was saying, thanks for watching all the way to the end. Really appreciate it. Please feel free to give us feedback in the comments. It's always very helpful. Other than that, I will see you in the next one. And goodbye.